Hey, I'm Dr. Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And I want to talk about a special, really sacred concept in medicine involving psychedelic medicine and what happens to your brain when you're under anesthesia having surgery or if you're having anesthesia outside the operating room, like in a ketamine clinic. I also direct the ketamine clinic and I help patients overcome incredibly challenging mental health and physical health challenges by helping them uncover their hidden potential. I had a patient recently I want to talk about who woke up from surgery telling me they never wanted to touch a cigarette again. Remember that smoking cigarettes is one of the most dangerous things you can do to your health and therefore quitting smoking is one of the most positive powerful things you can do for your health. And for somebody to wake up after surgery and tell me, doctor, I don't ever want to touch a cigarette again. After years of trying and relapsing, it has to make you wonder what is it within themselves that came out through the process of having anesthesia, a compassionate doctor to help guide them to ultimately wake up and not want to even touch, touch a cigarette. Like I said, most powerful thing you can do for your health. What happens with psychedelic medicine? We're going to talk about it. But first, I see so many people on here already. Heidi, so good to see you. Melissa, um, oh, good to see you from the TikTok Live. Have I ever seen LTH? No, I haven't. But um, bronchospasm and laryngospasm, I hear your concerns. We will talk about it and what you can do to help minimize that risk. Um, very, very good question. First, I want to talk about why did my patient wake up? wanting to make the most impactful change in their life that I could ever ask for, ever hope for. What helped them feel so empowered that Chantix couldn't do it, no amount of other therapy or et cetera couldn't do it. I'm not saying those are bad or ineffective, but I'm saying there's something else that patients can uncover within themselves. And then we'll talk about bronchospasm and laryngospasm. I promise, uh, Melissa, we'll talk about your LTH. I don't want you to go into surgery having that fear of dying because our mindset incredibly impacts our bodies because we see it under anesthesia. When you're connected to the ventilator and the, and the monitors, we see it because the mind and body are connected. And I want you to enter the operating room with a mindset ready to heal yourself and not with a mindset terrified of LTH. We will get there. So what, first of all, what is a psychedelic? And what am I holding in my hand? This is propofol. This is not the psychedelic in the sense of a hallucinogen that we think of from ketamine, psilocybin, or other types of what we call classical psychedelics. Propofol is given IV, which is fundamentally different than mushrooms or other things that people take orally. I can fine tune to a very fine degree the plasma concentrations and how much ultimately of this propofol is reaching your brain. And that helps with what's called disinhibiting, helping break the cycles of cognitive rigidity that my patients have especially in surgery. Before they come into the operating room, patients come into here. Guys, it's literally a room with these scary lights up here, a friendly anesthesiologist, but otherwise, you know, this kind of fancy, funky looking ventilator, monitors, all sorts of medications that are going into you. I'll just give you a flavor of what you might see here. This is my medication drawer, all these vials, all these medications, white stuff, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff here that can cause panic and anxiety. But I help my patients overcome this. And like I said, because of that mind-body connection, the greater they can overcome that, the more I can tell the monitors how healthy their mind-body connection is, their vagal tone, etc. But more importantly, their bodies will go through surgery more safely. They'll wake up with fewer chances of complications, less chance of acute print, pardon, <clears throat> acute pain transitioning to chronic pain, uh, nausea, and other complications. So psychedelics help in one sense remove us from the perspective that we're locked in. Cognitive rigidity is one of the most disempowering conditions that humans live with all the time. I have cognitive rigidities. You listening, if you're a human being out there, also have cognitive rigidities. It's when we fall into habit loops for example, when someone's coming into this operating room, one of the most common things I hear, Doc, I always get really nauseous. I'm always waking up nauseous. Please give me something for nausea. Of course I'll take care of your nausea. I don't want you to be concerned about that. 
But what's happening with the mindset that's preparing you? You see an operating room, you think nausea. That is a loop, we call a TBR loop, triggered behavior response, triggered by some medical setting. The response is just jumping to this feeling of needing a nausea medication. Well, it turns out that probably in, uh, increases your risk of nausea. Same for pain, same for depression, same for anxiety, all sorts of triggers. Our brain forms these rigid loops where it fuels itself, fuels ultimately its own suffering and pain, whether it's physical pain, that we're, what we call chronic pain, or emotional pain, extended bereavement, etc. And uh, Fire Med Chick, which is, I guess you're now, hey, let's talk about it, talking about PTSD and ketamine, IV. And I hope you can also share here your experience where when we can be removed from the cognitively rigid patterns that we live our lives in, whether it be things that cause us to uh, ruminate about the past, perseverate about the past, which is what leads to depression, or loops where we just can't stop thinking about the future, perseverating or ruminating on the future, what we call anxiety. These are the cornerstones to us suffering. And when we come in the operating room, you have this huge stress of surgery. You're literally locked in a room like this with the lights and all that. But patients can break that loop by embracing three things. One is that they have a compassionate, loving guide. Hopefully your anesthesiology doctor there is guiding you through a medical coma, but you have faith that they are there to carry you through this otherwise stressful process. Having trust in those around you is so important whether you're coming in the operating room with me or in my clinic with me. I want my patients to have as much trust and confidence as they can that I'm gonna guide you and take the best care of you that everyone in the room is making sure that you're the most important person. You're the VIP for the next couple of hours for your surgery or if it's for an academy and infusion for the duration of that infusion. Second is you have the stress of surgery. Sometimes life puts obstacles in front of us and we don't have the perspective to appreciate that maybe that obstacle is actually hiding a door that's open behind it. I don't want it to sound too woo-hoo-y or too out there, but it's just reality. And it, we see this medically in the sense that patients get stuck with barriers to their own healing that they have trouble looking beyond to go through a door that might be opening a new set of opportunities. In the psychedelic uh, zone, we talk about changes to self-representation. So when you're coming in for surgery, you have this huge life trauma. You're literally being cut open on this table that I'm sitting next to. But that can help catalyze a powerful change that can then, with number three, lead to fundamental changes in our self-representation. And that's the effects of psychedelic medicine. To be able to give us different perspectives on problems we've been struggling with for a lifetime, with inflexible habit loops we've been struggling with for years, decades, maybe all our lives. Maybe they came from adverse childhood experiences. Maybe they came from PTSD. They may have come from anything in the past, but it's our responsibility, it's my responsibility. When I have a patient struggling with one of these habit loops, it's not their fault, but it's the reality of what they're struggling with. It's my responsibility as much as it is my patient's responsibility to have that introspection, to lift themselves out of their current self-victimization sometimes, out of their current hyper-focus on the past or the present, like I said, rumination and perseveration of the past is depression of the future is anxiety. Lifting them out, literally ketamine is what we call a disassociative anesthetic, because when I use it here in the operating room, if not dosed properly, it can put people in a K-hole where they feel so separated from their body it induces panic from feeling that they just can't get back into their body again. I, before we go into bronchospasm, laryngospasm, because I know Melissa wants to get that question answered, I have to also say that there are many ways to achieving this hidden healing potential. Psychedelics are just one way. Spiritual experiences, religion for some patients, can all, nature, can all help us change our perspective. Just like when someone comes in the operating room, instead of being locked in this room and locked in 
our cycles of suffering can help lift us out to give us a glimpse of other opportunities of solving the problem. You don't need psychedelics, but in some cases, medication can be a powerful trigger or a catalyst in a good way to help the inner healing come out. Uh, and that's where the smoking cessation addictions, smoking, uh, narcotics, etc., are all powerful examples of addicted loops. We might see a drink, we might see someone using fentanyl on the street. These all trigger these dopamine rushes that sometimes overpower our, I don't want to say willpower, but overpower our brain's protective mechanisms against indulging in that dopamine rush. And that leads to, to addiction. And that's a classic loop. It's not a, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault, but I'm saying there's a loop of inflexibility where this cycle cannot be exited. And psychedelics allow us to exit that cycle, even if for a brief period of time, so that we can reevaluate why the cycle is there in the first place. Okay, uh, there's so many comments, I will get to them. Please though, if you uh, appreciate me coming in here after a bunch of cases <laughs> of surgery um, to share this too, please hit that like button and share what you've learned with others because you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told and that's what we talk about on this channel so that you all can hopefully, if you want, reduce your need for medications and live your life with greater meaning and purpose to ultimately tap into that healing potential and not have to see me in the operating room. <laughs> okay, um, great. So Melissa, Melissa is talking about ling tonsillar lingual, as uh, a lingual tonsillar hypertrophy. So there is um, immune system tissues all over your mouth. We think about tonsils, typically the ones behind the tongue on the sides. When I do anesthesia for a tonsillectomy, patient comes on here, we place a breathing tube, and then the ENT surgeon zaps out the big tonsils. Well, Melissa's talking about lingual tonsils, which are in a slightly different place, but it's the same concept. When your tonsils get too big, they might impede your ability to breathe or swallow. They might lead to sleep apnea. And for any number of reasons, we need to remove them surgically. It is more rare to have lingual tonsillar hypertrophy than to have adenoid. Um, or other tonsillar hypertrophies, but the anesthesia is the same. Where you're going to be under general anesthesia, and boom, right there, many patients have a fear. We're talking about TBR loops, triggers, behaviors, and responses or rewards. Well, anesthesia causes one in four patients. Just the thought of general anesthesia can cause them to postpone necessary surgery, which is heartbreaking because. For example, uh, Melissa here is sharing how she's so afraid of having the surgery, and I hear you, right? Recognize that this is another example of an inflexible cognitive loop. It's not your fault, I'm not blaming you, but recognize that there's a trigger and your brain is automatically increasing your heart rate, increasing your blood pressure from just the thought of the surgery. How do you overcome that? Um, for those of you who've been here before, I always recommend us thinking of three C's. That's confidence, control, and certainty. <laughs> and what does that mean? First is confidence, because if you're, uh, actually, let's take a step back. Let's talk about uh, certainty. When you're uncertain, you have anxiety. It's the classic way. Whenever you're not sure you can do something that you need to do, human beings feel some level of anxiety. And that anxiety can spiral out of control, whether it's in an operating room or if you're trying to drive your car down the street, you get anxious if you don't think you can do what you want to do. If you don't have confidence in what you're doing, confidence is another C. And if you're not certain, if you don't know what to expect, and that's why expectations are so powerful, especially before surgery. So when you know what's going to happen to your body under anesthesia, when you know about the breathing tube, you've seen an operating room like this one, you've met your anesthesiologist before. These help give us confidence that we want to have the surgery, gives us a sense of control because we're voluntarily choosing we want to have the surgery, and it helps give us the antidote to breaking anxiety, and one of the other C's is uh, curiosity. Curiosity about what's going to happen to my breathing after. Am I going to be able to breathe better? Maybe I'll have a little bit of pain in the short term, but am I going to wake up with less sleep apnea, less difficulty swallowing. That curiosity, Melissa, is so powerful for any anxiety or fear invoking 
event. Now, in your case, I'm not your doctor. I cannot give you medical advice, but I can encourage you to keep up your questions, keep up the curiosity, and talk to your anesthesiologist as soon as you can before your surgery so you can get the confidence, the certainty, and engage in the curiosity to quench that anxiety before it takes a toll on your body where you might be too afraid to have surgery, where you might not be able to have the optimal recovery, might wake up with more pain or more nausea or have more side effects. So I hope that answers your question, Melissa. Uh, all right, let's ask a couple other questions here, answer a couple other questions before we take off. Chris, good to see you. Um, uh, okay, good to see you, Chris. Thank you for the kind comments. Health, uh, Teresa is saying, also medical PTSD is so real. Sadly, not all healthcare professionals are as caring as they should be. Teresa, I agree with that. Um, a lot of uh, providers, especially in a busy place like the operating room, sometimes treat things like a pill mill or treat it like a factory line. I can't control what other people do. However, I can empower my patients when I call them before surgery, if we're talking right now even on social media, to empower yourself because at the end of the day, you are responsible for the mindset that you bring in to any event in life. Whether it's surgery in an operating room like this one, or if it's given a speech, an athletic event, you have power, but you have to assume responsibility for it. I'm not saying it's your fault, but I'm saying that we have an incredible healing potential that's revealed when we engage in our ability to affect our mindset, independent of what other professionals around us might do, or you know, should be professionals like Teresa is saying. Um, Okay, Chrissy Segan, good to see you. I think it's the first time. I have IV midazolam at the dentist, but because I'm, I'm on morphine for chronic pain, it doesn't always work. So I take extra morphine and diazepam, that's Valium, although my dentist doesn't like this. Is this dangerous to do? Chrissy, I can't comment on your specific details, but I can say that anytime we mix benzodiazepines and opioids, it is a setup for overdose. It's how Heath Ledger died, how so many other famous celebrities have passed away. I've talked about him in other podcasts or other uh, live streams. Medzodiazepines, I mean, propofol here is what killed Michael Jackson, right? So, uh, very dangerous to do, and your dentist is rightly so about the concern. Um, okay. Pudding cake says ketamine infusions are great. Um, I'm happy to hear that. Next day for me causes anxiety, but it's so much better the following day. Pudding cakes, thank you for sharing your perspective and your experience. Paul, good to see you. Uh, Marajan, good to see you. Thank you for the kind comments. Um, Brian, good to see you as well. Thank you for the kind comments. Um, we'll answer one last question. Uh, and this is Melissa's question about laryngospasm and bronchospasm. When you go under anesthesia, whether it be with propofol or with anesthesia gases, like the ones that come out of the ventilator here behind me, I'll show you. This gas, this gas here, it's called sevoflurane. You can see the SEV. We activate it by turning a knob up here. These inhibit, they turn off parts of your brain that are responsible for your normal functionings, like breathing and your heart beating and all that. When you turn those parts of the brain off, they can cause weird reactions in your body, like preventing you from breathing. Sometimes it comes from what's called laryngospasm, where your larynx actually closes in on itself. The Vocal folds almost look like a triangle like this. And we, with our hands, we try to mimic laryngospasm. I hope it's not like a profane. <laughs> I'm not meaning anything. <laughs> just, just imitating what the vocal cords look like. They kind of close, they snap shut. And when they snap shut, air can't make it through. When air can't get through, you end up, you can develop fluid in your lungs. You certainly can't breathe. It can be very dangerous. And it's one of the serious dangers with anesthesia I see it much more commonly in my patients who use marijuana on a daily basis. But if you tell your anesthesiologist in advance that you suffered from laryngospasm in the past, we can give more anesthesia, which is the antidote to laryngospasm. Just so you know, in the most severe cases of laryngospasm, we actually have to paralyze the whole body. That's why, we, that's why every anesthesiologist has um, these medications here. You see how it says, Warning, paralyzing agent. These paralyzing agents paralyze the vocal cords so that they open up, so that those shut vocal cords open to allow you to breathe again. 
That's different from bronchospasm, which is spasming of the bronchi, where your bronchi close. It's like a severe asthma attack. Bronchospasm and asthma are pretty much the same thing. Bronchospasm can be triggered from anything under surgery or under anesthesia as well, especially the breathing tube that goes into your trachea. That can cause all those muscles to spasm in your lungs and it closes off the airways. It can also lead to fluid in the lungs uh, and many other complications. The antidote, once again, is to deepen anesthesia. But if you've experienced it before, your anesthesiologist may give you um, ketamine, ketamine bronchodilates. They might give you an albuterol inhaler. Uh, before anything even starts, might give you glycopyrrolate, another medication that's always in this cart back here. But if you tell your anesthesiologist, we will modify as needed to help minimize those from happening again. Does that answer your question, Melissa? I'm not gonna let you go until you feel more confident. So please tell me if there's still something lingering here, because the more confidence you bring into your surgery, your willingness to want the surgery will help you have a better outcome. And not to mention everyone else, I'm sure, is also learning from your great questions. Uh, pudding cakes. Melissa, I have vocal cord dis So pudding cakes is telling Melissa, I have vocal cord dysfunction and mild asthma. Now that I figured out my vocal cord dysfunction, I can definitely tell a difference when I'm having asthma versus laryngospasms. Yes. Brittany, good to see you. Crazy cat lady, good to see you as well. And Rob, good to see you. Um, okay. Melissa, I'm waiting for you to confirm that I got your question answered here. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple more minutes here. Pudding Cakes is saying, why is S-ketamine recognized but not IV infusions? So Pudding Cakes, we'll have a whole live stream on this, but ketamine IV is typically a racemic mixture. It's not the s uh, the, the S-ketamine, that, that enantiomer of it that goes into the nasal spray. It's because of money and patents that uh, that one was studied and therefore insurance can cover some of that, um, if maybe sometimes all of it. But IV ketamine, for many reasons we can discuss, is my preferred route because it's what I use with my patients all the time. It works so fast, so reliably, and I can titrate down just like with propofol to very, very fine levels of what's reaching the brain to help patients more quickly achieve the right psychedelic state to gain the insights we're talking about, all that perspective to help bring them out of their cognitive rigid loops help them get a glimpse of the hope and opportunity to escape that inflexible habit that people just live in for many parts of their lives. Uh, great, great question. Um, well, Melissa, oh, here we go. Um, so, Melissa, I am happy that we talked about your concerns. I hope everyone else learned from uh, your concerns about laryngospasm and bronchospasm. Certainly, speak with your anesthesiologist. None of this is medical advice. It's just recommendations and medical information for y'all to feel more empowered because the more you can expect, the greater you can overcome your anxiety, whether it's for surgery or for anything else. Um, I wish everyone a great rest of the day. Um, oh, great. Sorry, Teresa, one more question. I need to get a celiac plexus block. I'm having trouble finding a doctor that does it. Is it an uncommon procedure? Teresa, celiac plexus block is not an uncommon procedure but it uh, does require an x-ray, does require a pain specialist comfortable doing it. Um, celiac plexus block is done in many different ways. The way that I was trained in doing it when I was a resident back at Harvard was uh, actually going through the uh, aorta, which a lot of doctors are not comfortable doing for obvious reasons, but uh, it does require special training. I personally do not perform this because I don't feel comfortable putting a needle in or very near the aorta to numb the nerves in the celiac plexus. Um, I suspect you have it for chronic pain or maybe pancreatitis, but remember that y'all have more, um, more, uh, what is Dirk? Melissa, I don't know what Dirk means. Uh, uh, I don't know what Dirk means, Melissa. <laughs> I hope we answered your questions, Melissa. I hope everyone learned something new. Remember that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. If you learn something new, I would appreciate it if you hit that like button. Uh, share what you learned with others to empower them as well because we have an incredible healing potential that can come out when it's nurtured. And that is from knowledge from others, from love and compassion from others, but also sometimes when needed from medications like psychedelics to help give us that powerful glimmer of hope 
from times that are sometimes dark or difficult to appreciate the open doors that are often surrounding us. Wish everyone a good rest of the day. Until next time.